Good afternoon. We're related to invite you to this session of Community Urban Farming with Serafina Singapuri under the patronage of Society of Friends of Trees. The National Society of the Friends of the Trees is a fellowship of tree lovers seeking to create and foster a tree sense in India. Founded in 1957 by stalwarts like then Chief Minister Vasant Rao Nayak, Mr. J.J. Baba, Ms. Mr. S.P. Godric, Mr. Uh, B.G. Gare and others, it has been headed by these illustrious personalities. At present, the President Emeritus of the Society is Dr. Firoza P. Godric, well-known nature and art lover and philanthropist. The Society has been active during the past 64 years in organizing public lectures and seminars on trees and similar subjects, holding exhibitions and competitions. Its annual vegetable, fruit and flower shows are very popular with tree lovers professionals and the general public. Organizing field trips in the form of nature trails, visits to forests and gardens, etc. Public, a publication of a journal, Varnashobha, and engaging in dialogue with governmental authorities and institutions for the protection, promotion, preservation and propagation of trees, forests and ecology in general. FOT's flagship event, the annual flower show, has had to be kept in abeyance this year due to the extraordinary circumstances we're all in. To keep our passion for nature and nurturing alive, FOT has initiated virtual connect for members and non-members through quizzes, online competitions, online demos, and workshops like today's program. This is an affirmation of FOT's commitment to spread its mission of green world ecology and environment. FOT now reaches out to its members and the world at large through its website www.fot.org.in and has also made its presence felt on social media platforms like Facebook, Instagram and YouTube. Now in introducing our speaker today. Serafina Oster Singapuri is the founder of Green Conscious Consulting a startup focusing on urban farming and environmental education. She has a BSc in Earth Systems from Stanford University and is a certified permaculture designer. Having lived in Mumbai for 20 years, she aims to address the environmental problems faced by this city with tangible grassroots projects in order to demonstrate that positive change is possible. Her projects include urban farms, community gardens, kitchen gardens and edible balconies at residential and commercial sites. She has also guided and set up waste management and composting systems at several housing societies. Mrs. Singapuri highlights the very essence of what FOT stands for, and it is both an honor and privilege to have her here with us today. Over to you, ma'am. Hello, Vipasha and everyone. Thank you very much for the introduction, Vipasha, and thank you everyone for joining. Um, so I will just get started with a little presentation and a video and I will um, uh, go through the presentation a bit quickly uh, so that we can keep in the time limit and then you can keep track of any um, questions you may have and put them in the, in the chat and I'll try to answer them at the end. So can everyone see my screen? Um, yes, ma'am. Okay, so the question I'll try to answer today is how can we create com community gardens that enrich our lives and our urban environments? So as we all know that Mumbai um, is faced with quite a lot of pro urban problems that are typical of any big city. Uh, one, and this is a view from behind our building, right in our neighborhood where we live. And so there's a shortage of green space and tree cover, uh, which then leads to a loss of biodiversity. And also this is related to a, an urban heat island effect. The, the cities tend to be a few degrees warmer than the, herb, the rural areas around them. And pollution of air, water, soil, and these also can get into our food chain. And then of course, there's the tremendous problem of garbage and how 
so much of our garbage goes to landfills, which leads to pollution. And then those resources, actually garbage is re a resource if we manage it properly, but those resources get locked up in the landfills and are not available for people to use. Um, and then we have to take out more raw materials from nature. Then there are social issues in, in the city. So social fragmentation, isolation, lack of community, lack of trust, uh, and all of these things affect our psychological well-being and our physical health as well. Um, in addition to our lifestyles of sedentary lifestyles and, and unhealthy food. Um, these are just general problems that affect a lot of people in the city. Then there's a sort of bigger issue, which is that it's difficult to remember your connection to nature when you're in the city. And, you know, if, especially if you've grown up in the city your whole life and have a chance to visit um, wild areas to, and or, or farms and things like that. So people may not who you know who haven't had these opportunities may be less aware of how we really depend on nature and therefore need to protect it. So the, how can urban gardens well sorry but forgot this one but uh, the way we eat represents our most profound engagement with the natural world. So our change can begin on our plates, connecting with nature through our food. Because you have an innate need to be connected to nature, even if we're not really aware of that. Um, I do believe that because we as a species have evolved to be connected to the land. And there's this quote attributed to Mahatma Gandhi that to forget how to dig the earth and to tend the soil is to forget ourselves. So <clears throat> I'm, I would like to try to help people remember these things and to reconnect with nature. So community gardens can, can directly address many of those urban problems that I mentioned earlier. Uh, one is that they provide green spaces which are refuges for diverse living things, um, not just plants, but also insects, lizards, birds, and things that we may not think about regularly, but soil organisms, and a whole complex web of life that is needed. Um, and then another thing that urban gardens can do is absorb carbon dioxide and release oxygen, and plants uh, are quite good at purifying the air as well. So it affects your immediate environment. And it also affects your, the, if, there are, if there's an increase in the amount of green space and, and terrace farms and things, it would have a, an effect on the environment of the whole city as well, to have a cooling effect to reduce that urban, urban heat island effect. Then uh, you, we have an opportunity to turn what we call garbage into a valuable resource, which is compost. And this can close the loop. So you use that compost to grow vegetables. Um, and these vegetables, because you've grown them yourself, you know for a fact that they're chemical free and that they're fresh. And because they haven't been trucked in from far away, uh, they are have more flavor and more nutrients and you can, get things from your garden that you may not even find in the market. And the social effects of community gardens are also very important. So um, by bringing people together in this shared endeavor, uh, they, they contribute to building resilient communities where people support each other, people understand each other better. And it these gardening activities are a fun form of exercise and they encourage healthy food habits, especially among children who, who may be resistant to eating vegetables otherwise. Finally, uh, growing food helps us appreciate our dependence on natural systems. So when you are tending to your garden each day, you do realize how the weather has an effect on, on our lives. And you realize how, how dependent we are on having things be stable and predictable.
And I'm very happy that this movement of urban farming has been growing in Mumbai and in other cities in India and around the world for quite a few years. So, and I, I'm, um, I've started doing this seriously about three, four years ago. Before that, I did things a little bit just for my on my own on balconies and things like that. Um, but other people have been doing this for quite a while as well, or longer. Uh, for example, Urban Leaves, uh, they've had various community garden efforts. Currently, they have, I think, just one now at Bombay Port Trust. That was their first community garden, and it's still around. And then there's a very nice community food forest in Bandra called Dream Grove. There's a Pramila who's, who runs, who is the mentor for that garden. She has a good and very good talk about it on YouTube. You might be able to find that. And then there are some other projects going on as well. There's a, at Fortune Heights in Mahim, there's a community garden there for the residential uh, society. And Earthaholics has lots of projects going on and Green Souls. Um, Julius has been doing this work for many, many years. And, and there are more, of course. So how do you get started making your own community garden? So I'll just share like some basic ideas from my experience. And of course, this is, everything needs to be adapted to your own um, conditions and your own situation, but I'll try to give some general guidance. So the first step would be to form a core team uh, of people who in your, in your community who are interested in doing this, who can spend, who can commit some amount of time to it and prefer, hopefully would have some knowledge of gardening or, or be uh, very interested in learning. And then if there isn't anyone who's very experienced with gardening, um, it would help to find a mentor who can guide you through this and give you advice. Uh, then the second step would be to identify a garden location. The most important thing in that is how much sun it gets. Uh, other things can be modified and controlled to some degree, but the sun is the basic requirement. So you need a minimum of four to six hours of sunlight and you should uh, try to observe and understand how this changes over the seasons as well. Because of, in an urban environment, the, shad the shadows cast by buildings are um, a major factor. Then there are other conditions that, that you'll need to be aware of like wind and heat and access, safety issues, security, and so on. So all those things you should observe, try to understand what the situation is at your site, at your site and what you need to do about it or, or what can be left alone. Then as a group, it's good to do some brainstorming, discuss and you know what, what it is you want to get out of the garden, what sorts of resources you have available, what possible things could go wrong and uh, plan for all of this and define your vision and your goals. And based on those, you can make a plan for uh, your garden, but also, sorry, I forgot to mention, but um, it's not just the garden, it's also hand in hand, you need to, uh, it's very important to set up waste segregation and composting in your building if it's not already in place because you'll need that compost in the garden uh, and they, these two things go hand in hand. So when you, and then you can make a, well, first, sorry, <laughs> the uh, waste segregation and composting, there are various organizations that can help you with that. And uh, um, one is RUR Green Life. So they can help with the training of the residents and the staff and they can help you set it up. Um, and help you and teach you how to do the composting. Once it's set up and running nicely, then it's really very little work and doesn't require much input or investment. Then you could make it, then uh, the next step would be to make a plan for your garden. So the layout, figure out what, what materials you want to, to use, how much it will cost and some plan for how you'll manage this. Then you would present the plans for approval and funding to the relevant decision makers. So if it's in a housing society, it would be, what we did was we presented it in the AGM and then the residents and managing committee voted on it. 
um, or if it's say a community park like the Dream Grove in Bandra, then you would need to get the BMC involved and things like that. So it depends on your situation. And also funding, maybe there would be different various sources of funding. Um, and you can do things very inexpensively, but yes, it does require some funds. Then you need a larger group of volunteers as well who will, who will pitch in whenever a lot of work needs to be got done in the garden. So I'm sure a lot of, most of you are aware of composting, but I'm just going to introduce the concept again, just very briefly, is that it's creating a loop where you, uh, you have to first segregate your waste so that your biodegradable waste, which includes food waste and garden waste and leaves and so on, are available to make compost. And then of course you can grow food. I made this slide for, for a kid's presentation, but it works for everyone, I think. And, and composting is a natural process. It is nature's way of recycling nutrients um, because there is no garbage or waste in nature. Everything is recycled. There are various systems and containers that you can use for composting. These are ones that I would recommend, depending on the scale of, of your composting, whether it's just for your own family, like these Kamba com composters from the Daily Dump in Bangalore are good. There's also Trust Bin, or you can get small tumblers from RUR. Then there are big tumblers from, that, uh, from RUR and from DART and from other organizations that can be used for the housing society. And in our building, I chose to a very inexpensive, low maintenance, but a little bit more effort version, which is compost pits. So these are cement pits. And um, we had to modify the design a little bit over time so that we could ensure that they drained properly and stuff like that. But it's a, th this is a very good system as well, just requires some manual mixing. Then Urban Leaves has a really has very detailed instructions of how to do a do-it-yourself composting bin from a, a large paint tin, um, paint bucket um, on YouTube. So you could look that up. It's Save a Leaf Solution 2 if you just Google that. And I wanted to mention this here because there's a lot of misunderstanding about it, but I strongly recommend, yeah, I, I do not <coughs> recommend these organic waste converters or composting machines. They're very expensive. Um, they, a lot of resources go into manufacturing them and also in operating them, they require maintenance. And plus the compost or so-called compost that they make is generally not real compost. It's just sort of dried or burnt material. Um, and I've seen various um, organizations that have these sitting there, these machines sitting there waiting for some part and not being used. And be aware, of course, just we're all aware of this, but when you're gardening, if, if you can think of ways to reuse water in your garden, then you, um, you know, you reduce the, the need for it. Uh, if you're just Growing plants at home, there are very easy, simple things you can do, which basically involve a bucket uh, or two. And then for your building, you could install a gray water treatment system or rainwater harvesting, harvesting system. I won't get into the details of those in this presentation, but they're definitely worth um, reading about and investigating further. So the next step, after you've gotten approval for your garden is to prepare the site. So if, you, if, there are, if there are already plants, think about what you would like to keep and what should be removed or shifted elsewhere. And while you're doing that, consider the various functions of the plants. So it's not just plants that are edible, medicinal, but also um, they could be there for shade or they ha could have served some purpose in maintaining the soil or for pollinators or something like that. So um, don't be in a rush to clear out all the plants that are already there. That's especially if you have a piece of land that you're working on at a ground level. 
Um, and then clear out any unneeded structures, objects, trash, etc. of course. And then if you're planting in the ground, take care not to damage the soil and the site through too much clearing or tilling or compaction through driving on it, walking on it. And consider, in an, especially in an urban environment, consider testing the soil for contaminants um, because it, depending on the history of the site, because some certain urban sites could have some dangerous chemicals in them. And then you wouldn't be able to grow in the ground. You would have to think of raised beds and other things. So if you're making a terrace garden, make sure there aren't any leakage or drainage problems and fix them if there are. And then you would need a water source. There are, you could, in our garden, we water with a hose pipe and a soft spray nozzle. I feel that that's a simple and easy way to do this. And you can, um, you know, adjust your watering from day to day uh, just by checking the soil. And um, otherwise there are drip irrigation and other systems which are very good about being efficient with water use. But I haven't yet um, really uh, been successful at using those. I, but anyway, they are good options if, if, you are, if you set them up properly. Then you'll need a place to store your materials and your tools. This is a view from above from, of our Zara community garden. This was when we had planted some of it and we're still setting up another part. And it doesn't really look like much from up here, but then when you enter it down below, you'll see in the tour that it's quite a different uh, view, a nice refuge from the city. So the next step would be to set up your garden. And so there are various, various options. This comes in the design phase also, of course, is like what type of containers or raised beds will you be using? And then, uh, but when you're designing and setting up, do consider the embodied energy of your materials and your designs. So where, what materials went into making those? How, how were they made? How far away were they transported from and so on? So you think about the whole life cycle of the material and try to choose ones that have the least impact uh, upcycling and repurposing waste materials is a great way to reduce cost and the environmental impact. And sometimes you have to get a little creative with that. Then we put a bamboo or a metal frame over the garden and this serves various functions. So it, it helps for trellising the plants and you can put a bird net on it if you have a bird, uh, you know, if the birds are disturbing your garden too much, um, a shade net if necessary in the very hot seasons. and. It, um, I haven't really used the poly sheet for monsoon protection yet, but you might, it might be beneficial in certain situations. So these are some examples I'm showing you. This, this is a garden in Delhi. There's an organization there that called Edible Roots that, that does a lot of urban farming. These are made out of bamboo. You could also have wooden sides or some other sort of repurposed material. At the bottom, there's a drain cell, which is like a honeycomb sort of plastic um, material, which is used for all kinds of terrace planting. And then the, it's lined with geotextile, which is a type of fabric, which is meant for these purposes. And brick planters can be made in the same way. This one doesn't look like it has anything at the bottom, but anyway, you can, brick planters are good because they're very long lasting and inexpensive, but they're heavy. And brick planters can be made in all kinds of creative shapes. Then this is our Zara garden. So here we've used bamboo baskets. And the advantages of them are that they're very inexpensive, locally made from a sustainable material, and they're lightweight. So if load on the roof is, a, is an issue that's in your building, then that's something to consider as well. And the plants grow in them really well. I mean, they let, they get, their roots get plenty of air and it works very well. Then this is another project I did, which in, in Goa, so this was in a, is in, in a small apartment complex in Goa. And it was like the simplest, easiest 
least expensive project that I've done. It just took a few days to set up and we used materials that were on the site or in the neighborhood. Uh, so we lay out the, we figured out where the sun would be most of the day and we lay out the planters, uh, just made a simple outline and measured. And then we used rocks from the site and put cardboard down because we were just putting it directly onto the grass. We didn't want the grass to come through. So we, we put a layer of cardboard down and then we put all kinds of materials, biodegradable materials that were lying around like palm fronds and coconuts and leaves. We made a nice thick layer of that at the bottom. And then we filled with soil and we got some cow dung from a neighboring dairy. And then we planted and put some straw mulch. And then I was like quite happy with how well it grew just in one, in about one month. This is what, what the result was. Yeah, and that, this garden was, we spent about 6,000 rupees total on the setup, which was mostly for the laborers. So after you've set up your garden um, and then you fill the containers with soil, um, which approximately uh, equal parts of soil or lalmati, compost and wetted cocoa peat works well in my experience. Of course, there are many other mixes that people use and other things you could add, but just to keep it simple, and this, this does work nicely. And then uh, it helps to understand your garden, the microclimates of your garden. So there could be some areas which are a little shadier than others, some that are hotter, some that get more wind, stuff like that. And then you choose plants um, that will grow best in, in, this, in the season and also this climate, but also the microclimates and you place them accordingly. And if you can choose open pollinated local varieties, then you won't have to buy seeds again. You can just um, harvest them. And I'll talk a little bit about that in my, um, in, in my garden tour video. And when you're choosing your plants, again, consider the various functions of them and how they fit with your goals and needs. And after planting, mulch well with straw, dry leaves, or sugarcane bagasse. Mulching is very important to retain the moisture in the soil and also to uh, you protect the microorganisms in the soil. So this is our garden after a few weeks. This was in, we had planted it in October 2018, and then this was in like December, or November, I think. So after you've planted your garden, you'll need to do the ongoing management of it. So your core group would be coordinating the activities and, and figuring out what work needs to be done and, and um, with a mentor advising if, if there's no one already in the core group with the knowledge. And then the, the larger group of volunteers could be called for weekly work or biweekly work. Someone needs to water the garden every day and, and then there's a lot of little puttering and checking things, seeing if some pest problem is there or you know, what sort of work needs to be done. So that daily watering and puttering can be shared. In our case, we share it in the core group. And then we have a weekly harvest where, people, where the residents come and pick everything that's ready. And then we lay it out for a free farmer's market where the residents come and take uh, whatever they want. And then after the monsoons, there's usually a little extra work that needs to be done, especially if you need to replace the baskets um, or you know, fill in more soil and stuff like that. So you might need to hire some laborers for the heavy lifting. And you can keep your running costs very low because if you make your own compost and you save seeds, you really have no costs. Maybe you need some tools now and then or gardening gloves and that's about it. Or there are some organic inputs that you could buy, basic ones, but they're not, they are, you know, you can keep those costs very low. The main thing is that it's important to keep learning and um, experimenting. So this is our garden after a couple more months, a few more months, I'm not sure what date this is. And the children harvesting some radish microgreens 
And in the beginning of the presentation, I was talking about biodiversity and gardens really do provide a, it's just amazing how such a diverse collection of creatures somehow appear in the garden from somewhere and then they thrive there. So we have lots of different insects and spiders, for example, and many of them are beneficial insects. Some of them are pests like this inchworm, but then the beneficial insects and the pests tend to reach some kind of balance. And we, we don't, we really do very little pest control management because we try to let the things sort themselves out. Like these are ladybug, I think pupae you call them, actually different stages of ladybug. And I didn't know what they were when I first saw them, but then I realized, yes, I should just leave them alone. This is a praying mantis hunting an aphid. And I don't know what this insect is, but it's like brilliant, golden, shiny. It's interesting. And then there are lots of earthworms in our garden. And of course, many other things in the soil that we can't see. And this is a sunbird that came to visit our garden once. You can see it here. It's drinking the nectar from the flowers. So. Oops, let me get to the next slide. And here are some, just a few pictures from our garden and our free farmer's market with our small helpers. And now I'll show you some videos. Uh, can you see this? Um, oops, I'm sorry, one second. Are you able to see this video community impact? Um, Pripasha? There's just free mm -hmm. farmer's market. On uh, I need to share a different window. That's what I was wondering. Okay. No worries, take your time. Can you see this one now? Uh, yeah, you have to share your audio. We can't hear. Uh, how to do that. <laughs> um, let me try again. Mom? While you are share, while you just select the option of share screen at the bottom, the option will come of share sound also. Ah, okay. At the bottom. Yeah. The option of share sound, you have to uh, select that option. Ah, okay. I see. Thank you. Oh, no. Um, I think I have to install something. Uh, okay, wait a minute, one second. Hmm. Okay. Can you hear it now? What is your favorite part about people? Yes, Garden? It is. Then I learn okay. how to grow trees and I learn the name of plants. Like what are the new plant names you've learned? I've learned thyme. Thyme? So the herbs? Yeah. And what is currently growing in your garden? We are now growing pomegranates and hibiscuses and mint tea. And you like stuff like planting or harvesting? What's your favorite uh, part? The favorite part that I love is when I um, plant seedlings. Why do you like that so much? Because when we used to do it, I got to poke my finger in the soil, which was cool. 
when we're down in the garden harvesting together, it's not like we're sitting around and chatting, but there's such a strong sense of community that is deeply fulfilling. That's one of the things that I really enjoy about uh, our kitchen garden. When we're harvesting um, the, you know, incredible variety of uh, herbs and greens that Serafina is always experimenting with, uh, I get so many lovely, fresh, healthy food ideas. I mean, my family always says that the garden is really the source of innovation in my kitchen. I just love that aspect of our garden. One of the best things about living in our building, Zara, is that we are the beneficiaries of a revolution that has been started in our building by Serafina. A revolution is not an exaggeration. It is a revolution in our city to have in our building these plants growing and giving us good health because that's what we are really eating, good health. It's planted, it grows, it blossoms, and we partake of the goodness of this garden. It's a lot of hard work for Serafina, but it's really worth the trouble. It's good for children, it's good for teenagers, it would be perfect for old people like me, it's therapeutic and if the community of each building gets involved and starts something like this on their terraces, it would be one of the best things that could happen in this city. People would get good food, people would get the satisfaction of growing things, being involved in the entire process and benefiting by all that nature gives us. I think, and also, what is fantastic is that Serafina has started a composting facility in our building. And the building's compost gets put into these baskets for the garden and it's an excellent food for them and each building could do that and it would be really a rewarding experience for all. I think every building should seriously consider doing something like this and involving the members of the building. Sorry, so I'm going to cut that video short because we're running a bit late on time. And then um, I will share another one which is the tour of the garden. Can you guys hear me still? Hello and welcome to our garden. This is Zara Tower and this is our community garden. Um, this is a podium level approximately at the second floor and it was designed to be a parking area but as it wasn't being used for that we decided to make our community garden here. So there is this outside area which is about a thousand square feet and then there is also an inside area which doesn't get any sunlight so this area we use for storing our materials and also we're making a mural here, the children are painting it. Uh, and so we also sit here and you know, do some of our work. So I'll quickly give you a tour. And this, right now it's covered with plastic because some work is going on in the building and we need to uh, prevent the paint and other debris from falling on the plants. But normally it doesn't have plastic over it. There's just this bamboo frame with a bird net uh, normally so we have we've installed water taps with pipes two of them to make things easy for watering the garden and the the surface is unfinished but it's properly waterproofed which, which we had 
uh, checked before setting up the garden. Also, the drainage is, is proper, which we that's another thing that we had checked. So we have a mixture of pots and baskets. Norm the perennials and some plants, you know, like the fruit trees, we grow those in pots because the baskets, uh, they need to be replaced periodically once every one or two years because they do uh, start breaking at the bottom eventually. The baskets are placed on bamboo, on three bamboo ro rods or pipes and then these are placed on bricks so that the baskets are raised off the surface uh, by a few inches. This allows the, the baskets to dry out a bit at the bottom so they, don't, so they last longer, otherwise they would um, decompose. And also it allows good airflow and it makes it easier to clean the area. And for people who are concerned about uh, leakage issues or roots growing into the surface, this also prevents that, uh, it creates a nice barrier. Otherwise you, would, you could have a planter with a drain cell at the bottom which serves the same purpose. It's just a smaller gap, but it also serves the same purpose. So you don't really need to worry about the roots growing into the surface if it's a properly finished terrace. So we have some fruit trees like this papaya. We have a couple of them. And we have lots of herbs and green leafy vegetables. And the reason we are, why we focused on the herbs and leafy greens is because for a building with 50 flats, and uh, just a 1,000 square foot garden, those things seem to be the most, uh, you know, bang for our buck in terms of being able to give people a bit of, of, of things when they need them. So whenever they need some herbs, they can come to the garden and pick them. And there's always enough of those for anyone who wants them. If we were to grow staple crops, we wouldn't have enough space to, to grow enough for, for a large number of people. But if, if this is just for, say, one family, you could grow a different variety of plants that would, you know, you could grow potatoes and onions and your staple crops as well and have a bit of those as well. So I'll just tell you about some of the plants that we have. So we have lots of lemongrass that grows very easily. Tulsi keeps seeding itself in various places. We have more than enough of that. We planted some Pineapples, those take a lot of patience. I think they take about a year to grow. We have, this year we had lots of eggplants and we recently harvested all of them and hopefully we'll get one more crop. I think we're getting some more flowers on them. These are some trees which volunteered in our garden last monsoon and I've been looking for a home for them because they need to be planted in the ground in order to grow big. So if anyone would like to adopt them, please message me. This is pandan leaf or basmati leaf. Uh, people use it in various things. It's popular in Thai cooking. This is custard apple. I grew this from seeds that I had removed from the fruits. I, I think it's about three years old. I think it, well, it grows a bit slowly in pots. But now it's finally getting some, some flower buds. So hopefully we'll get some fruit soon. There's celery, mooli or white radish. Uh, one technique that we use often is that we sow things a little thicker than necessary. We sow the seeds more thickly and then we remove them. Uh, we keep thinning them in different stages. So microgreen stage, then baby, leaf stage and then right now we need to thin this also quite a lot and which will use the greens and then we'll leave the remaining plants to grow big and the, then the radishes will form nicely. There's a concept in permaculture of zones and zone 5 is a wild zone so that is a place on your farm or your garden that you leave alone that you interfere with as little as possible so we even though we have just a thousand square feet we sort of have a zone five as well so 
this these two baskets are an example where I just things just happen to grow in there on their own and they uh, I think it's quite a mixture of plants some of them are wild edible greens like this one which is water leaf and some mustard which I guess some seeds fell Peperomia pelosia is the shiny little leaf at the bottom that has medicinal properties there's tulsi and there are some other little things like clover and other plants this is Thai basil which has gone to seed and the bees love the flowers of many of these plants so these little wild so-called wild areas they serve as a refuge for mainly insects like ladybugs and uh, bees and other creatures that might get disturbed if you're say replanting a basket completely so a, a lot of things in our garden just happen on their own like this is a chili plant that I planted and also I'd thrown some marigold seeds in around so these are the marigold seedlings this is the chili plant and these are Malabar spinach which grew on its own because lots of seeds had fallen in the basket so I guess now is the time that we should shift some of the marigold seedlings to other places and we could harvest the, mar the Malabar spinach in this young stage when it's nice and tender um, so that we leave enough space for the chili plant to grow big. There's arugula, spinach. Spinach is a successful plant, easy one that people like. This is Brazilian spinach, which is grown from cuttings. It's a very easy plant to grow in this climate. We have a small lemon tree, but so far no lemons. There are young tomato plants. This is garlic chives. Someone had given me a clump of them uh, a couple of years ago and then they just keep multiplying. I'm happy to share these with people if they want. This is Arby, where you use the leaves and the roots, or taro it's called. This is ivy gourd, or tindley is the local name for it. And it's a little messy and it's cleaned up but, and, and trimmed. But it's a nice uh, creeper that's quite productive. And this you grow from cuttings. It's also a perennial. We have meti. And this is a Thai chili plant that's still nice and productive after two years. We grew these somber onions from onions that we bought in the market. This is butterfly pea or blue pea flower. It's used for coloring drinks or making blue rice and other things. This is ginger and turmeric. And if you see, we've thrown the, the dry leaves in the basket at the base of the plant. This is uh, helpful generally with any kind of leaves, as long as they're not diseased is to keep them as a mulch on the ground and, and these nutrients from these leaves then get recycled into the soil through composting, a slow process of composting, sort of like a forest floor process. So leaves are a very, very valuable resource and you definitely should not waste them or burn them. This is lettuce, which is starting to get a bit overgrown. There's tarragon mixed with tulsi, which grew on its own. There's flat leaf parsley. This is a pomegranate bush. We recently harvested most of the pomegranates, but we're getting some new buds and flowers. That one also grew from a seed. Mint, thyme, and some a flower, which I forget the name of. <laughs> it's also, it has medicinal properties. An edible stevia which is an alternate sweetener there's Genovese basil this grows nicely and we a lot of the plants go to seed so this this stalk is ready to be harvested and kept and that you know the seeds can be saved from this this 
This is a bush pepper plant. It can be grown from cuttings and you get some nice pepper from this. This is a nice compact plant for a terrace or a balcony garden. Curly parsley, more arugula, oregano. It can be grown from cuttings as well. And this chili plant uh, is the only chili plant that I grew in, the, the, sorry, <laughs> we grew in the last season which survived the leaf curl virus. All the others got badly affected by it. And this one now, because it seems to be, have a little resistance to that virus, I've been saving the seeds from it. Hopefully its offspring will also have similar characteristics. This is fennel, red oak leaf lettuce, more ginger growing back there, which we recently transplanted. coriander, lemon basil, peppermint, insulin leaf, and our banana tree is just developed this nice flower. This is an allspice tree. The leaves are used in curries. So here's another example of a plant going to seed and there are bees that, that are hovering around the flowers. It's difficult to catch them. There's a bee doing its job. This is coriander and you, you see the seeds are forming nicely. This is a star fruit. This was grown from seed as well. It takes a while to to become productive. But here we have we have a nice fat fruit for, <laughs> fat fruit forming tongue twister. And here's rosemary. That one's a bit finicky in this climate. Some more coriander. Red amaranth. Again, we sowed this rather thickly so that we could harvest the, the microgreens, which are this size, and the baby leaves, which are like this size. And once you clear out the extra plants, then the other ones grow to be big, and you can cut and harvest them a couple of times. This is morning glory, which is very nice in stir fries, and it grows really well during the monsoon, monsoon season. This is a little chiku tree. And finally, after about a year and a half, we're getting, well, we bought it as a seedling from the nursery. It's a grafted seedling. You can see the graft here. And this one is a chiku forming and some more flowers. These are cucumber plants. Uh, so it's, it's useful to grow gourds in the hot season. So they'll climb up these strings, which we have tied to the frame above. And if there's no plastic covering this, which we'll remove soon, then they'll grow over the net and create a little bit of filtered shade for the plants below, which is helpful during the hot season. It makes it so you don't need a shade net. We also mulch with sugarcane bagasse, which you just get from the juice vendors. So this is a very useful uh, local free resource. This is a guava tree. And here is a nice guava forming. This is, I think you say Brahmani. It's an Ayurvedic medi uh, medicinal plant. This is red romaine lettuce, which is going to seed. It's in the dandelion family. You can see the seeds with their little parachutes. This is bok choy. Dill, which is also going to seed. We need to do a little work in our garden. And water leaf, the young plants. These are very nice vegetables, very nutritious, wild vegetables. We have some cherry tomatoes. This is a tejpata bay leaf. 
has such pretty new growth. We have various edible flowers or medicinal flowers, which are nice to add color to the garden and attract pollinators. Here's some more tomatoes. This year we didn't have that much luck with tomatoes, but last year we had lots. And there are more pomegranate plants. This is our nursery area, which is protected from the direct sun. So we grow things in seedling trays and also in small uh, containers that we've uh, reused, like yogurt containers, milk cartons, things like that. Uh, or paper cups or anything that's around that, that you can, that's the correct size. So some plants like to have the larger containers. So these are cartons, which have grown from seed and these are chilies and then yeah so they're different sizes of seedling trays so the little ones are used for the leafy greens the big ones for tomatoes and things and chilies and the yogurt containers would be for other plants that need it more space this is pawn leaf it likes to grow in the shade so does aloe vera sorry about the noises in the background and i wearing then we have some more rosemary plants growing here, trying to protect them so they don't get overwatered. Oh, sorry about the noise. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this tour of our garden. And if you ever want to visit and see it in person, then you are very welcome. And just send me a message. Huh. Oh no, one second, let me stop this. Hi everyone. Yeah, can you guys hear me? Uh, yes. So that's the end of my presentation. And uh, does anyone have any questions? Um, so one of the questions that was asked was, um, I'm going to pick up a uh, few of them. Uh, what do you think is the best material we can use as beginners for building the garden, as you were mentioning, bamboo, etc.? What would be the best material? Well, I think the easiest things it just sort of depends on uh, where you're building the garden and how big and so on but um yeah any of the materials that i mentioned would be good uh, if you're just doing something say on your windowsill or balcony probably pots are the easiest uh, option and you could uh, use other containers any kind of large container and reuse that that would also work you just need to make sure there's some drainage holes in the bottom of it um, okay. and the, the, sorry, the, the bamboo baskets, there's a guy um, in Perel who makes them. If you wanted to, if you need the contact for that, I could give it. So um, the next question is, um, I think at the end, you can maybe link in your contact details as well as this number. Some people have asked that on private, so you mm -hmm. could put it in the chat box. Um, how does different weather in different places where you worked affect the way you build a community garden? So I've only worked here in Mumbai on the community garden stuff. Uh, when I was younger though, when I was a kid, I, I lived in Colorado. And so, yeah, that's very different with the seasons. And, and yeah, I was always helping out in the family garden there. And yeah, the challenges in Mumbai are heat, and during the monsoons, the heavy downpours and the wind. So those are things that you need to plan for. And, and sometimes though, like if, if the monsoons are really difficult to manage, then you just take a break from gardening in that time and then start again after the monsoons. But last year we did manage to grow things throughout the year. Uh, what I learned was that if you have plants started in May, and they've gotten a bit strong, then then some of them do survive or even thrive during the monsoon without any kind of extra protection. Okay, um, I hope that answered the question. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the next question was, uh, what would be the five best fruits or vegetables to grow in a very limited space as we do in Bombay? So 
if you have just a little bit of space and want to grow something for your family, I do think like herbs and chilies are, are useful things because you use just small quantities of them, but they make a big difference in your cooking to have fresh herbs and a variety of them available. And then uh, the other things would be, yeah, and in herbs that includes say curry leaf and mint and lemongrass and basil grows easily here, of various types of basil. And then the Mediterranean herbs like rosemary, oregano, thyme, they do grow here once you once they get started, they're okay. And I have, but I've had a hard time growing them from seed. So I could help you guys out with that. Uh, and then the, yeah, then there are a bunch of other herbs that are used in Indian cooking, which are useful. And then other fun things are cherry tomatoes, but they tend to take up space. They climb all around and yeah. So certain plants require very large containers like tomatoes or gourds. You, they should be in a container that's preferably about 12 inches across. And then the herbs can be in smaller pots like nine inch diameter pots or even six depending on which ones. Um, so um, one, another question was, what is the process of transplanting a plant as you mentioned? So if you've grown something in a seedling tray or in a yogurt container or something like that, you just, you need to first prepare the, the, plant, the pot where you're going to shift it to, um, you know, add compost to the soil, loosen the soil, then you dig a little hole and then you very gently like turn the, the plant over from the seedling tray. You try to take it, out, take it out of the container without damaging its roots. And then you place it into the hole you've made and, and like fill in the hole, press it a little, and then you put mulch around <laughs> and water it immediately because the roots have been disturbed. So, so they need to recover. And it's best to do that in the evening, to tr do transplanting in the evening. So they have the night to recover. Um, okay, right. And I think the last question we'll be taking was, um, what is the cost like for building, say, a community garden as the one you showed in the video? In the previous video? So that one... shared by all the members or is it? Yeah, that one, the, the society gave uh, funds for it. And actually, We've gotten, because we did the waste management system also, and the BMC checked it and approved of it, they gave us a 10% property tax rebate. So actually, our society overall has made money from these things. So some of that money that we got back from the rebate, we've used to build the garden, but then the operating costs are very low. But when we made the garden back then, which was two years ago, it, initial material costs were about 80,000. So I, I tried to keep it as low as possible. Now I think it might be closer to a lakh for the materials cost. Also, we had some things already available in the building like the long bamboo, but they're, they're all like small things, but yeah, that's the materials cost. And then if you were going to get a consultant to help you, then there would be separate charges for that. Okay. okay. So I think that's it for our questions today. Um, I'll ask Anuja now to give the vote. Hello. Yeah, hi Anuja. Yeah, so uh, thank uh, you so much, Safrina, ma'am, for an enlightening and an entertaining session on community gardening. The knowledge that you shared during the session for, was both fascinating and timely. We at FOT would look forward to talk to you in real space and would like to see your community garden. Also, I would like to thank the entire Xavier's team and the FOT team of teachers and students for bringing this session together and making it a success. And once again, thank you, ma'am, the viewers and the FOT team for taking out time for taking out the time to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pasha. And thank you, Anuja. I'm just posting my contact details in the chat right now. Um, yeah, I'm just going to leave it here for a to everyone. And yeah, thank you so much Viposha for inviting me for, to do this talk. And thank you everyone for taking time out to listen to it.
um, I hope that the ideas are useful and you'll be able to apply them. Um, could you put your contact details to everyone? It's on direct message. Oh, sorry. One second. Yeah, I'm learning. <laughs> Seems can't really copy paste. Yeah, it's there. So I hope next year you guys can have the the flower plant show in real life. Yeah, that would we, be nice. Thank you so much for being thank here. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank Goodbye. You, Bye. Take care.